can begin. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Haberman Institute for Jewish Studies final lecture with Professor Paul Lips on Islam in the Middle East. This lecture is titled From Secularism to Religion, Politics and Sociology in the Modern State of Turkey. As a reminder, over the next 45 minutes or so, Professor Lips will speak, followed by a question and answer period. If you have questions, please enter them in the question and answer section at the bottom of your screen. Thank you for joining us, and I now welcome Professor Lips. Good morning. Um, it's uh, wonderful to be back with you again. Uh, I'll just do a little bit of um, review of what we've done in the earlier sessions. This is the third and last of the series. Um, in trying to work out how to present this very, very broad topic, remember we're talking about uh, 1.7 billion Muslims in the world, um, I took tried to take three different kind of realms. The first realm was very much concentrating on the Arab Middle East, uh, Saudi Arabia in particular, and we looked at the Sunni, the 85% of the Muslims in the world who are Sunnis. In the second session, we looked at uh, the Shia world uh, dominated by Iran, and there we went into a different kind of environment by virtue of fact that the Iranians are Persians, Iranians, uh, but uh, Shia influence very much moves into the Arab Middle East as well. And now in the third session, we're going to take a case study, a one country and or one empire uh, kind of situation to try and really see what happens when uh, we find there's a very, very interesting interaction between two forces, which we've actually mentioned in our earlier sessions. And that is on the one hand, you have Islam. Islam appearing in very, very different ways in different parts of the world. And for those of you who sent in wonderful uh, questions, and I try to answer most of them directly to you, um, I, in a number of cases I mentioned that um, Islam is uh, clearly not only a theology, it's very much a political concept. As I presume one can say of Judaism with the state of Israel and in uh, Christian countries where it became very, very uh, politicized as is the case in the Vatican. So um, here we're taking Islam, uh, which uh, is a different kind of Islam from what we find certainly in Saudi Arabia and also a different kind of Islam than what we find in Iran. Because here Islam is defined as a moderate Islam and um, without going into the ongoing discussion of what is moderate and radical, uh, the whole nature of uh, Islam in the Ottoman Empire, which later became uh, Turkey uh, in a much smaller realm, we, we really do see that here Islam tries to blend with the population. And there's no way when you look at the Islamic authorities, can you compare their power with the power of the Wahhabi uh, Islamic uh, uh, controlling Islamic force uh, in Saudi Arabia. And when you look at uh, the power of the Ayatollah uh, or Ayatollot in plural, Hebrew plural, uh, that you would find in Iran. So this is an attempt to kind of give another point of view and to accept that Islam uh, in the Ottoman Empire and Turkey was always on the side of the leaders, although the leaders in some cases, particularly when we look at some of the sultans in the Ottoman Empire, are very, very uh, central. Now we're talking about a long period, so my apologies for jumping vast and very important times, but I've basically tried in my slides to choose those periods where we can really uh, extrapolate something of the tensions between a very politically oriented society and at the same time a, a very Islamic society. We certainly have to add one other word to uh, the two terms that I've just used, uh, religious and uh, political, and that is military. We're speaking here about a highly military society and uh, particularly when we look at the uh, Ottoman Empire at certain times, it seems to be that it's almost all about military, all about expansion. Then we come to the second theme that I'll be dealing with, which is Ataturk, Mustafa Kemal, uh, the father of the Turks, who's a totally military man. 
And when we come to the period after Ataturk, after 1938, once again, we find that military components are very important, although society is a civil society. So let's get into the story. So we're talking here about a, a very, very powerful uh, a period between the 14th century and the early 20th century. Uh, the growth of the Ottoman Empire is something quite unbelievable. It's just an amazing, amazing story. And at the end of this presentation, you'll see with the YouTubes that there's probably, I've always wondered, you know, how does one learn about uh, the Ottoman Empire? Well, there's an excellent uh, YouTube uh, from the uh, history, historical perspective, um, which is, uh, covers the whole period of the Ottoman Empire in an hour and a half. So, for all the things that I'm going to be leaving out, if you just want to sit in a relaxed room and spend an hour and a half following the YouTube program, I think you'll get a very, very uh, impressive kind of overview of what's, uh, what's going on. So the period of the Ottoman Empire has tremendous ups and downs. Uh, starting in the uh, early 14th century uh, under Osman, uh, it develops quite quickly into from a tribal society, a tribal organization, uh, expanding, it's, it has a number of enemies. And uh, for the Muslims of the Ottoman Empire, for an extended period of time, the real enemy uh, are the Christians. Byzantine uh, Christianity is what is a threat to them. However, Byzantium uh, influence is already uh, on, on, the, on the decline. And so a rising Islamic society is confronting a weakening Christian society. And that's kind of what leads us to the tremendous power of the Ottoman period. Uh, like all empires, uh, the rise and fall of the Roman Empire is fairly similar in some very broad senses to what we talk about here. Uh, a period of about three or 400 years of tremendous growth. Uh, growing in all directions, by the way. At a certain time, they extend over to North Africa. At other times, they're going very much into Europe. You can see the map there extending right up to the gates of uh, Vienna. That's what is often described as the uh, Western extreme uh, of the Ottoman Empire. And then at various times into large parts of Asia. So we have this uh, really unbelievable kind of empire. And if we can take just maybe one period for a bit more analysis, let's look at the period uh, 1520 to uh, 16, six, uh, uh, 1566, where we have Solomon the Magnificent. This is really a fascinating period because here you have a leader who manages to bring together many, many very effective components of en empire building. He is a defined Muslim. But his Islam is also very economic, very political, and very military. So you have the intertwining in a very important and powerful way uh, where Solomon the Magnificent manages to bring his multi-level talents uh, and expand the Ottoman Empire uh, pretty much to its greatest extent. Now, what he also brings in, and I think often when people look at the Ottoman Empire, the military and political components are so overwhelming that I think, think we forget one other point, which is absolutely vital, vital, and particularly when we talk about uh, Solomon the Magnificent, and that is the legal side. A very, very a deep thinker uh, who had to really work out how does one control this massive world? a massive part of the world without uh, modern communications. And he developed some very important components whereby uh, rather than forcing the uh, suppressed occupied people to take on Islam, except in one or two particular cases, he actually allowed them to retain their religion. And this is why uh, in many, many cases, although today we see to modern Turkey in a very different light. It's very interesting that even at a moment of empire building, uh, there was this ability to bring in 
uh, and understand that you can control areas of the world without forcing people to change their sociological, economic, or religious uh, structures. So I think that is why Solomon the Magnificent is, is studied in uh, such unbelievable uh, detail. Um, Islam, uh, uh, Solomon had close to him uh, what we might call religious leaders, but many of them are really religious political leaders. Uh, and therefore, we find almost no real conflict uh, between Islam and the political components of the Ottoman Empire. But what do we see, and what does seem to be uh, the most important issue? That uh, Suleiman the Magnificent and the more successful of the sultans, and some of them were highly capable, he was not the only one, is really trying to blend how do you take a religion and blend it with change? And at the same time, we know with all religions, there are inner tensions, which we certainly find in the Ottoman Empire, between the modernizing groups who remain totally Muslim in their very existence and the more traditional groups. So once again, over an extended period of time, there are these uh, inner tensions. The Ottoman Empire has one very important goal um, besides its uh, imperial goals, and that is seeing itself as the protector of Islam. Um, the, much of Islamic history is about the caliphates, uh, Khalifa, the, the people who would actually uh, theoretically be the central controlling people of Islam. Now, we know there are many contradictions to this theory. For example, we, si we find with the, uh, when we look at Islam in, in Spain, um, various uh, uh, Muslim leaders felt that they were the caliphs. And so you can have various periods of history of multi-level caliphs, uh, something like uh, what you have in Christianity with the popes, where there are times when you have two popes, and it seems to be a total contradiction, but that is what happens in these kind of societies. Um, is the, the, the basic component of Islam, as we see it, is uh, this uh, interesting interaction of uh, war, war mobilization. The, the Muslims are part of the war mobilization. At the same time, they have a very important, we're talking about the senior Islamic council, a very important role in prayers, prayers before the wars and prayers after the wars. And, and the highest uh, Islamic authorities were always close to the various sultans. Um, however, we have to remember in the old style of empire, it was number one. It was the leader who is the ultimate leader. So even when we talk about uh, the Islamic authorities being close or being important, they're always very much under the, uh, the, the, the other power, the power of the Sultan. Who you, we can't really use the term secular power. That, that just doesn't make uh, sense. Um, the muftis, the same religious authorities, uh, were, were defined as the living bridge from pure Islamic jurisprudence to Islamic life. I found that quote absolutely fascinating because it really is this idea that religion is a living phenomenon. Sometimes, as I said in some of our earlier sessions, we, we get caught by the idea of Islam or any religion as being only theological. And here I think we have uh, very important components where th it is about life. And that is where uh, they, the authorities want to see themselves. The, from a Judaic perspective, the Millet system um, for, uh, is very important. And it, it's true for all uh, non-Muslims. This is the concept that I mentioned briefly before, whereby uh, the uh, Muslims would essentially accept the fact that a non-Muslim could stay a non-Muslim. Now there were exceptions, and we have to mention one very important exception, and that was the uh, military soldiers, the Christian soldiers, the young boys the, uh, who were incorporated into the empire, and um, they would be forced to become Muslims at a certain time. So there were exceptions, and, and by the way, those young uh, Christian uh, uh, boys became the central fighting force uh, of, of Islam uh, in, in the Ottoman Empire. 
The, uh, what happens with the, the melee system is essentially the following. Um, you have your own religious authorities. In the case of Judaism, you have the person uh, called Chachambashi, a uh, Sephardic leader. We're talking here about Eretz Israel, Palestine. But uh, wherever you find the millet system, where you find the Jews, for example, in the Ottoman Empire, you see that they are under their own religious authorities and they can just carry on doing their religious thing. In the definition of the series, I said where possible, and this is one particularly good case, I, I did mention that I wanted to bring in where do the Jews fit into this picture. Well, when we look at the end of the 15th century, we have to look back at Spain. Um, the expulsion of Jews from Spain uh, in 1492 uh, was a major crisis for the Jewish population, and the Jews are trying to find uh, where they can go. Um, and uh, obviously, initially, they want to go to Portugal. Uh, they, some would go further north, for example, to Amsterdam. Uh, others would be trying to go to the west and would get to the Caribbeans and uh, Brazil, um, and uh, others to North Africa. But it's interesting to see and look at the issue of what was the role of the Jewish population in the Ottoman Empire. And here we find something about the ultimate pragmatism of this particular empire. It could have been totally oppressive, which it was in a sense in the wars. But in terms of the Jewish population in particular, the uh, Ottoman authorities realized that to run an empire, uh, you need uh, a number of very important talents, which were somewhat lacking in the core areas. One was people who knew languages, Jews. The other were people who were literate, certainly the Jewish population. The third, those who understood a changing economic world, uh, certainly once again, the Jews. And more important perhaps than anything else, the Jews are going to be loyal citizens. The Jews have no alternatives. Jewish history is as much as anything else, a search for a patron, patrons. Um, and therefore the Ottoman authorities really become the patrons of the Jewish population, not because of any love on any kind of level, of the Jews, and we'll see this mentioned a little later, but rather because the Jewish population could fulfill a certain need. Now, it didn't always work so easily. At certain times, the Ottoman authorities wanted to increase their population, particularly when uh, Constantinople was eventually uh, um, defeated and uh, the uh, Muslims converted, changed the Ottoman uh, capital to Istanbul, uh, and no longer Constantinople. Um, in, in cases like that, and in other cases as well, uh, Jews from one part of the Ottoman Empire were uh, told, get up and move because we actually need your talents in a, another world. So for, uh, from a Jewish perspective, the Ottoman Empire has some really wonderful stories, uh, uh, sometimes uh, ending uh, in tragedy in, in, in certain areas, which later came under Greece, for example. Uh, but essentially, there were great periods for the Jews uh, during the uh, Ottoman Empire. As time went by and the Ottoman Empire goes into decline, using that uh, much used term, the sick man of Europe, what we're beginning to find here is the development of the capitulation system. Capitulation system was an agreement between the declining Ottoman Empire and the Christian states who were going through a tremendously powerful uh, stage, um, the, the I general idea was that uh, consuls would, be, would have a tremendous amount of power, that there's that moment in the, with the decline of the Ottoman Empire when uh, it seems almost as if the empire is about to disappear and the way that somehow the system is going to carry on is to allow the consuls to take on semi-political powers. It, it's an interesting topic in itself, so we haven't got time to go into uh, all the components. The slide that you have there is a sign of a non-Muslim group coming uh, to the Sultan and kind of bow bowing down. You, there were taxes and things like that as a non-Muslim, but essentially uh, for non uh, 
members of the minority Christ, uh, uh, religious groups uh, around the world uh, for many periods uh, the Islamic uh, case study of the Ottoman Empire was a better case study uh, than in other parts of the world not totally but talking about specific periods at the end of the uh, mid and the towards the end of the 19th century we have the Tanzimat, uh, Tanzimat period, the reorganization. This is when um, it's beginning to be understood by the Ottoman authorities that they can no longer run situation in the same way. They're becoming increasingly aware of modernity. Uh, modernity is slowly creeping into the Ottoman Empire. Uh, the Western world is becoming uh, much more powerful. And so there's an attempt at that time to, to move Islamic, to keep on with Islamic principles, but to recognize that some of the laws were outdated. It's a period of, of slow and sometimes uh, painful uh, stages. And this is really something which many Muslim societies have found. Uh, we see it, for example, in, in certain cases in uh, Tunisia, but not only, in, in other uh, Muslim societies as well trying to keep Sharia, trying to keep uh, religious law as the core concept of your society, while at the same time understanding that there's a, a changing uh, a sociology and a changing economy uh, that is going on. And we come here towards the end of the century with um, uh, Sultan Abd Abdul Hamoud II. Uh, uh, and this is kind of an interesting part. Once again, I've put it in particular uh, because this is the period of the rise of Zionism. Now, Theodor Herzl in his uh, diary, uh, three volume diary in Hebrew and one uh, volume shortened diary in, in English, he, uh, Theodor Herzl writes very, very clearly uh, about the structure of the uh, Sultan, Sultan world the Sultanate, perhaps, world at the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century. And it becomes very, very clear that here with the whole concept of the global Sultan has changed tremendously. The Sultan stays essentially in Istanbul. Uh, there are these uh, tremendous palaces uh, which are, are being built, um, some very, very uh, important and unusual literature about the harem uh, of the various sultans. And, but what's important, once again, from the Jewish perspective, is what uh, Theodor Herzl found. He, he realized quite quickly, very sophisticated person, was uh, Herzl, um, uh, a global person in many senses. He realized when he got to the uh, central core of the Ottoman Empire, that this was a world that he had never really come in contact with before. Very, very con uh, uh, complex, tremendous amount of subtexts and sub rulers within the uh, declining structure of the Ottoman Empire. And uh, he uh, had to deal essentially with two issues. One was, how do you negotiate? How do you get to the Sultan? Uh, and he, he realized that much of uh, what became later Turkish society was influenced by uh, uh, bakshish, by the bribery system. And Herzl didn't have that kind of experience, but people were all, the, the declining empire, uh, problematic economic situation, uh, bribery became very, very important, as we know, by the way, with uh, detailed reports of three um, uh, Ottoman governors who were ruling over Eretz Israel, uh, Palestine, and, uh, and how difficult it was for the Zionist movement to understand how to deal with them. Bribery was a, an accepted way of dealing with issues. Anyway, Abdul Hamid II uh, said to Herzl something very, very clear. He said uh, that uh, I can't, I'm not going to give you Palestine. Um, because Palestine is not mine. It belongs to the Ummah, to the community. It's a word that I haven't used yet, I don't think. And it's very, very important. This idea of the collective, uh, although it's a, 
Islam is a very, very hierarchical concept. They speak a great deal. It's often in the uh, central context that although you have hierarchy, the leader is the Sultan or later on the Prime Minister or the President of Turkey, very much speak about uh, the community, the Ummah. We are the representative, we are your per people. We are representing you, a kind of government uh, uh, for the people, by the people, which is not a reality, but that's the kind of uh, idea. And um, this idea that uh, Abdul Hamid, is Hamid uh, Abdul Hamid, sorry, speaks about uh, uh, that the, the blood has been shed uh, for this land, well, uh, that's a, a part of a completing narrative, I presume. A rapid change. First World War, essentially the end of the Ottoman Empire, the uh, growing nationalism which we see around the uh, Europe and various parts of the Middle East brings into fall someone who plays until today uh, but perhaps in a different role, a very, very uh, important role in this new period of what, what used to be the Ottoman Empire. In the First World War, the uh, uh, Ottomans found themselves on the wrong side. They went in with Germany. Someone in one of the questions, chat questions, asked the, question, uh, asked the issue of the role of uh, Lawrence of Arabia. Very interesting movie, by the way, I always recommend it. Uh, for viewing. The, um, the Turks for, uh, go in with the Germans, uh, which is essentially uh, the wrong side, and Turkey is in a, a, at a moment of history where it seems to be the Turkey that will come about is essentially uh, going to disappear. Mustafa Kemal in the First World War, a, a young and very, very uh, dynamic uh, military leader, plays an amazing role in defeating uh, the British forces in a dramatic uh, battle situation. And from 1923 to 1938, he is the uh, father of the Turks. Once again, fascinating language. I've always said titles should be studied in detail because they mean a, a great deal. Atatürk, father of the Turks. He's a combination of a remarkable human being. And I'm, I'm mentioning this because I think it's so very important even when we look at modern Turkey. Now, we're going to have to remember Ataturk, in some senses, is very, very different from the modern administrations in Turkey. The modern administrations, uh, as we'll see a little later, are totally within their Islamic role, as they, and as we will define it. Um, Mustafa Kemal is uh, worried about Islam. He doesn't want to exclude it totally, but he, go, he brings about what has often been described as one of the most dramatic internal changes of any society. It is almost a total internal revolution by someone who is totally part of the very society uh, that he's uh, uh, changing. He recognizes, as a result of events which had happened at the end of the 19th century and the growing Western power, as a result of what had happened in the First World War and his understanding of the power of the West, they had won the First World War, they lost the battle that he was involved in, that um, Turkey really had to go in a new direction. And he is the ultra, ultra nationalist. There is no one who could be more Turkish then uh, uh, Ataturk. He, in a very short time, brings about dramatic change. He abolishes the Sultanate, the Sultanate which had been, as I mentioned earlier, both a, a political and at the same time a religious structure. Um, he uh, abolishes the, Salt the Caliphate, that high level that the Ottomans regarded themselves within the world of Islam. Religious schools are abolished religious brotherhoods, the wearing of the fez, which is very, very typically Ottoman, um, and perhaps more than anything else, abolishing Arabic script. L the Latin script came in almost overnight, causing absolute crisis in societies, and would make in a very short period of time, particularly for the older people in the, in the, in the country, uh, illiterate. Um, 
he, the women were emancipated and by 1934, they were allowed to vo vote in parliament and held uh, seats in the parliament at a time that this was certainly not the case for women in a vast number of other countries in the world. On my visit to Ankara, where you see the mausoleum, um, uh, I, I, I think maybe it was one of the best uh, learning museums that I've ever been to. That whole tremendous structure, uh, by the way, which with some uh, uh, Turkish graduate students of mine at Tel Aviv University, I once was talking about this topic and I happened to say the word museum, um, which it is in many senses, but one of my Turkish students said, no, 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 that's not a museum. It's something else totally. And what is it? It's this beautiful, massive structure. It's really an, an unbelievable structure uh, built uh, after he died, where every aspect of Ataturk's life is recorded. I, I, I couldn't get over the, the uh, his automobile is there. Um, and it has a kind of almost a pride of place. There was something which I think struck me, which I, I don't know any other, many other people going through uh, the structure would look at it in the same way that I did. But I saw a matchbox where it, it seemed to be that his tooth was inside the matchbox. So this is the veneration of a person which has played an unbelievable role until today in Turkish society. And what is the role and what do we see about uh, Turkey in 1938 when he passes away, is that Islam is having to look at itself uh, once again. Um, the uh, state is now, uh, unlike earlier periods where there were religious authorities and religious brotherhoods, the state is now, at the, as a result of Ataturk, uh, totally responsible for supervising and controlling religious activity religion and state have come totally together. And if we just go back to Saudi Arabia, for example, for those of you who were with me on the first session, we, we spoke about the uh, Ibn Saud, the uh, political leadership um, go in, in 1932, forming this united Saudi Arabia, and the Wahhabis, the Salafists, as two different structures. Here it's all incorporated into one. Uh, in a very, very uh, powerful way. Um, the um, the uh, Ataturk had attempted to restrain Islam, but let it be still in the private arena. Uh, you know, it's kind of pri uh, personal law, as we would see it in, in Judaism. Um, the, what is extremely important and valid until today is the tremendous difference in Turkey um, as a result of the development of Istanbul uh, uh, many centuries ago, the, what we're beginning to see here is the fact of the deep division within Turkish society. On a realm that I just uh, can't get over, um, traveling on a bus from Ankara to Istanbul uh, many years ago, uh, deliberately on the bus, um, it, I, I just couldn't get over looking at the difference of structure, uh, the difference of lifestyles, those little villages that one goes through, the bus would stop every now and again in a little village. And what would one see in the village? Um, very Islamic society, very much aware of the power of Islam in the villages. And at the same time, in many cases, you would see Mustafa Kemal on his horse. There's a famous picture of Mustafa Kemal on his horse. And here you really see that the events up to 1938 permeate even into uh, modern uh, Turkish life. Excuse me. On the other hand, the city is rapidly going through tremendous change. And for those of you who've been to Istanbul, uh, you may have um, realized that uh, like many cities, there are always uh, many aspects of, of all large cities in the world. But I think in some cases, this is the uh, city where I felt the greatest difference. The modern Western uh, city of um, Istanbul, uh, you don't find it so sharp in Ankara, by the way, 
is uh, is so Western. Um, the everything about the people. Um, no, we, I spent some time speaking to university people there. Um, everything about them reminded me that I was totally in the Western world. And then you would go to other areas, the more traditional areas, and I realized that this was so far, hundreds of years ago, it felt to me, not literally, felt to me uh, hundreds of years away from um, what I had um, seen um, half an hour earlier. And when I was there, um, some years ago, uh, one of the uh, issues which was very, very powerful to me was the mass migration of people from the poorer rural areas into, uh, into Istanbul. Istanbul today has a population of between 14 and 15 million people. And um, you therefore have those uh, ex-rural uh, uh, residents moving slowly but surely into Istanbul because of, um, for economic and uh, other, other reasons. Um, we, we move on, sorry, we move on to a later period. And this is kind of almost an overwhelming challenge. Turkish politics uh, are among the most complex that I've ever studied. I've studied in, in great detail 23 countries. Um, Politics always confusing, but I, I, I've met no country where the challenge of understanding what's going on uh, is, is so great. It is a multi-party system, which might in, indicate on one level that it's democratic, but it's uh, uh, not particularly democratic, um, and, and sometimes it's almost anti-democratic, but that it's this rapidly changing kind of society. Now, what is a change? What are the changes? Firstly, political organizations come to the fore and go into coalitions and break up. In some ways it almost under, looks something like Israel. Together and, and away, a different leaders taking on different roles. So the political life in Turkey from the 1940s onwards has been very, very uh, uh, changing political life at all times. But perhaps of even more interest is the role of the military. On four separate occasions, starting in 1960, 1971, 1980, and then 1997 in a slightly different role, the army has come into the center core. And this army, its role, and this is now in, in this century going through major change, but until fairly recently, until 15 or 20 years ago or so, the army's role was seen and defined in the constitution as protecting the secular country, protecting the secular Turkey. Now, Turkey is not a secular country, but therefore the army have played this very interesting role in terms of seeing it when the parties are moving to become too Islamic, they come in. They also come in, by the way, as a result of the very, very tough situation which Turkey has found itself between the radical left and the radical right at, at various times. We've seen this in, in different countries of the world, just to uh, put it in a, in a broader context. We find this in Germany in the 1930s between the Nazis and the communists. Uh, we find it uh, at a not too different time period in Argentina uh, uh, even as early as uh, 1919 and in various occasions afterwards. So you have these countries and Turkey is one of them where the uh, left and the radical left and radical right are, are in furious conflict and the center isn't managed to keep things going and that's when the army came in. Now the army was uh, brutal. Uh, we can see some pictures there uh, but the army really uh, defined itself not as a uh, necessarily only a military uh, force, but rather as a very civilian kind of force, trying to keep Turkey on the straight and narrow in uh, one way or the other. Uh, part of the crisis uh, came about through economic ups and downs. Turkey um, has uh, recently, although in the last few years we see the definite economic decline, 
But Turkey has gone through reasonable economic growth, uh, considering that it's a, a large country, approximately 84 million people. Um, but uh, there have been some very, very tough periods as well. So you put uh, politics left and right, you put Islam into the salad bowl, and in addition to which you, you put the uh, various economic crises, uh, and that really was an entree for the army to come and uh, get involved. By the way, what we have with the Turkish army, and we see it in one case in 1960, and it came about uh, in Turkey once again a few years ago, there were deep divisions within the army, different factions in the army, and that makes the whole situation more difficult. The army took a, a major extreme situation when it even took uh, former ministers of the earlier government of the Democrat party, uh, which it saw as sympathetic to Islam and uh, executed three of the ministers, including the prime minister, and uh, 12 of the central political people uh, were given life imprisonment. As we move into the 70s and 80s, uh, once again, it's a period of radicals on all sides. Um, the army is coming in in 1970 and then in the 1980s, uh, deep uh, till, uh, political violence. And um, here the question is, where is Islam? And the answer is that in the 70s and 80s, Islam is there. It doesn't disappear but it disappears because of the behavior of the non-religious groups. And here, by the way, it is definitely possible to use the word secular Muslims, which is a, a term that in most cases one can't use. And there are definitely secularists in Turkey. They see themselves as secularists. Uh, you see people who define themselves as, as liberals. Um, and they are, uh, are looking for another Turkey. They, they, they were happy with Mustafa Kemal had he not been an autocrat. I think that would be the best uh, description. Uh, on the other hand, Islam is always there because in those large areas of Turkey, this massive country uh, uh, covering various ethnic groups, the Kurds being the best known, and they really remain Muslims. It, it might be a very local inward looking Islam, but it's certainly always, always there. And Ottomanism is there, um, even during the times when the religious uh, factions and the religious parties are suppressed. As we move into the modern party, the uh, welfare party, which is, uh, would be known as the AKP, by the way, party names are, are changing all the time, it's difficult. Um, we're beginning to see here that uh, uh, the uh, Erdog Erdogan, the uh, person who has been president now in political power for almost 20 years, um, he is already mayor in 1994. He is a fascinating person. And one always asks the question, did he see himself as a more Islamic Atatur? Is, is that the model? And one can add another question in looking at this person, and I pose these as uh, uh, issues to be always discussed with different perspectives. Does he see himself today as a leader who wants to continue the great period of the Ottoman Empire? And for, if any of you are following events of the Middle East, you'll know that he's becoming increasingly involved in Libya, for example. And he's shown kind of imperialistic concepts. So, once again, you know, I'm a, a great believer that history never disappears, be it as it may. Uh, as a result of reading a poem which had some uh, Islamic kind of uh, component that the uh, army didn't like, he was in prison for uh, a bit of period. And we see that um, from 2001, 2002, when he moves into politics, he is a highly astute politician among, I would say, one of the uh, astutest politicians which one can see in the in the century and uh, what he has manages to understand is that he has a saleable commodity and the saleable commodity is islam not islam of the saudi model or, or the iranian model but an islam which i initially defined as a moderate islam an Islam of the people. 
And what he does when he initially becomes prime minister, and later he's going to be, uh, become the uh, president, is to uh, spend a great deal of money uh, on developing the country and, and uh, uh, schools, roads, hospitals, um, going down to the people. He, he sees himself as a people man. And at the same time, his pragmatic point of view very much wanted to bring Turkey into the European Union. On my visit to Ankara, I sat with a political scientist at, at the Ankara English Language University, a very good university, and we were discussing this question of, you know, would Turkey be accepted into the European Union? And he said to me very, very clearly, this is some many years ago, he said, no, under no condition. And I said, why not? And he used the following expression I'm using, quoting him, it's not my own words. He, he said, it's, it's a Christian club. And he said, Israel would never be allowed in either. So that was his, his take on it. Um, Islam from in the modern period is a religion to suit Turkey. It's that kind of Islam. The picture I stand for hijab is fascinating. The hijab story is a whole story by itself. We just haven't got time to go into it, but it's very, very important. Uh, the symbolism of the hijab is, is more than one can even imagine. It is so important. It is a statement that you see uh, every time you begin to understand what's going on. Um, the governments, uh, the AKP, whenever they've been in power and sometimes less in power and, and sometimes more power, uh, they've spent a tremendous amount of money and energy on uh, developing the mosques. Uh, some 9,000 9, mosques have uh, been built in, in the recent period uh, by the president. Um, the, um, the clothing, the Turkish flag is, is important, but more than so, more than anything else is the, the segregation of the sexes. Once again, in a deeply divided society, the richer areas of Istanbul, the people there, you go into the malls, you go into the restaurants, it's no way of people really uh, possibly supporting an idea of uh, a sex seg uh, a segregation. But once again, this is the kind of the theme which the modern Turkey wants to present to itself and to the, the wider world. Just to take, because the clock is ticking, uh, just a, a few of the uh, more recent events. The uh, Erdogan and uh, Gulen conflict is, is a, a sig very significant one. Uh, uh, Gulen it was a, a deeply religious man. He built a sub, what was called, what Erdogan defined as uh, the deep state, a, a sub-society where he was sending all his uh, people into the different government ministries to essentially be able to take over the government at a certain time. I, I had this discussion with various Turks over the years, and uh, you know, there's always this uh, competing narratives. There are certainly those who do feel that that is true, and those who say uh, it, it's not really what it's all about. There was a, an a, important event uh, in 2013, uh, kind of a, the Getty Park uprising, which is the modernists. They started off as environmentalists, by the way, getting involved with some very, very tough uh, police action. And uh, it seemed as that Turkey was going into a secular religious kind of uprising. It didn't happen. The AKP becomes more powerful. There were times when it doesn't seem to be happening. And here we find our, the president uh, looking uh, pretty angry. Um, there was an attempted army coup in 2006, which failed, which brought about mass, mass um, um, re releasing, uh, firing people from government positions who seemed to be supporters of the army coup. Uh, journalists, uh, a large number of, of uh, police and, and military people were put into jail. And then at the moment, we find an interesting situation. In the 2017 referendum, uh, Erdogan, who is looked at and perceived as being so powerful, and by the way, he has used this, the powers of state in the last few years in a system that one can hardly, couldn't even imagine on some senses on the opposition existing. Uh, he has used the police and the army 
in very, very effective kind of means. But at the same time, I think what is very important for us to remember about Turkey, and however we see the Turkish government, is that many of the people, particularly in the cities, are very much against this Islamization as they see it, although it's only a modern Islamization, and they want Turkey to be a Western country. They were deeply hoping that Turkey would be allowed into the European Union. So the referendum was an iffy kind of situation. But what's more significant, where once again, a man who's looked at as the controlling force, the, the modern Ataturk in many ways, uh, were the uh, recent elections, 2019. What do we see there? We see that in the, in the cities, uh, the, uh, the AKP failed. And the loss in Istanbul in particular, as well as Ankara, the fact that the mayors were opposition people who won says in a very, very clear way that Turkey, and like many other countries of the world, is a divided country. The rural, less educated, more Islamic people on the one hand, in the government, supporting the government, and now very much in, they are in control of the army and the police. The army is no longer the army that it used to be. Senior army officers resigned uh, some years ago um, on the one hand, and the cities, which altogether are approximately the five largest cities, altogether come to about 23 million, 23 million in an 84 million uh, country, so they're very powerful, and particularly in Turkey, not only, but many countries of the world, we know that the capital, the large capital, is where real things are happening. And in that reality, uh, Erdogan does not control the country. My very last two comments, what has happened to Islam? Trying to summarize, Turkish people want components of Islam, but are concerned about economic survival. Economics has become very, very important. Uh, the opposition port, uh, forces are pretty clear what's happening to them. And uh, the president is loved by the rural and lower uh, middle class, while others want a real democracy. Very last comment, you'll be receiving a copy of this, uh, uh, of this slideshow. Um, I mentioned initially the history of the Ottoman Empire for one and a half hours. Terrific. There's a, an excellent short documentary uh, of, uh, on Ataturk, uh, a shorter one which gives an overview of Ataturk to the modern period, and a nice little uh, subsection, uh, four minutes, on the mosque building in Turkey. Thank you very much, and um, I will try and get out of this so we can uh go back to the other screen hey thank you so i'll just jump right into the questions over the last few minutes you have a good number i'm going to start by trying to combine two of them here there's there's a couple of questions that, about the time period between ataturk versus erdogan and just how, how it's changed for the jews and someone else noted that you know uh, ataturk's photo was ubiquitous everywhere and how maybe how how things have changed uh, more recently good so the, the Jewish situation is not good in Turkey. Um, Ataturk um, doesn't show um, any great interest in the Jewish population. Um, he, he, he wants to build a Turkish identity. Now, there are some countries of the world where the Jews are problematic. For example, if we take Poland, we know that in the 1920s, the, the Jews are a problematic group for Polish nationalism. That doesn't really seem to be a major role uh, during Ataturk. This government has moved in a very different direction. Just to give one symbolic uh, component is um, uh, maybe two points. Um, uh, is uh, Turkish citizens who've come to Israel uh, are petrified to go back to Turkey because they might be called up for the army. So there's no kind of recognition that you've been a former Turk, but now you're an Israeli citizen. So that kind of uh, dilemma comes up. Even more so, just as uh, more than a symbol, but it is symbolic, I suppose, is the, the synagogue in Istanbul. It is a closed fortress. Uh, the uh, Many, many synagogues are, as we know, around the world, have uh, military people around. But this one in particular struck me so much as 
a sign that the a small uh, Jewish population, I'm not quite sure of what the latest statistic is, but it is not a good place uh, for Jews, generally speaking. Uh, and I've been at the, um, found myself at the Istanbul airport traveling through, uh, uh, not just for an hour or two, uh, and I must admit, I felt very, very uncomfortable as an Israeli uh, at, because of the treatment of the customs officials. With, with only a few minutes left, there's, there's one question here that seems to be a, maybe a summary of some of what, of bringing it, bringing some of the things you brought together. Um, and then there's a, there's a great number of other questions here. And as we've done in, in previous weeks, uh, Professor Lips has offered to answer questions individually by via email. So um, I'm assuming he's going to do so again. We'll, we'll, we'll pass along all of these great questions to him. Uh, so here, so this, this is, I'm, I'm going to quote it here for you. Given, you've, you've given us a great overview of Islam, both historically and in current times. Thank you. What do you perceive as the biggest threat from the Islamic world to Israel today and to the Western societies in general? How should each be dealing with these threats to mitigate them? Well, great question. The great, greatest threat the world, you know, I, you know, I, I would put the threat of uh, nuclear I Iran as number one. I, I think that's the, the, the greatest threat. I, I, I think at the same time, I think it's very important for us to try and develop some sort of dialogue with those more Western Muslims. You know, I, I know it's difficult. I, I've, I've been involved in these sort of discussions uh, myself, uh, um, and, but I've been quite amazed when I've spoken to Muslims in Europe, that's obviously the, the, the best place to meet them and speak to them. I've been absolutely amazed at their openness. So. I, I've spoken often, you know, in Israel and trying to speak to people and, and lecturing at universities. I, I, I've said, you know, we have to find allies in the world. Uh, the Jewish people needs allies desperately. I mean, I'm sure that's very much uh, on the American Jewish agenda as well. Um, and I think that, that one of the issues we have to realize that just to take the Iranians, for example, so I see, see Iran as the major threat to us, but the Iranians I've met are, are very, very friendly. And just as a case study, if any of you follow the ADL uh, anti-Semitic uh, um, global polls that they have, the last global polls by the ADL Anti-Defamation League shows very, very clearly in looking at the Middle East that the level of anti-Semitism in Iran relative to other Arab uh, Muslim countries is actually very low. Um, so I, I think this is really where be going. I, I know it's difficult. We're living in, and in, in Israel and as Jews, I think we're living in a kind of a tough period of our history. But I'm totally convinced, um, and through personal experience of, of discussing it with Muslims in various parts of the world, uh, Muslims from um, the Middle East, basically, that we have to find allies in that area. And I think, I know it sounds old fashioned, <laughs> but I still go back to person to person relationships. Um, People, uh, Israelis have told me that they knew, had friends in pre Khomeini Iran who they've still managed to remain being friends with. Uh, I, I know some colleagues of mine who, uh, um, who are able to get in the United Arab Emirates, for example, uh, Bahrain uh, and places like that. And they said they, they find it very, very comfortable. So I, I would say, you know, with the challenges, and I, I, I put, the Iran nuclear threat on the one side. On the other side, I think some attempt at softening the tensions uh, where we find ourselves would be a good idea. You know, I've been described as a idealistic liberal and I take that as a compliment. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I think that's, that's a great way to end the, uh, our seminar series. So thank you again for this wonderful lecture. And I have enjoyed learning with you this summer, and I imagine all Thank of our you. participants feel the same. Thanks uh, very much. Yeah, we By hope to way, have you. Uh, one question: Maybe yeah. when I answer the chats, I'll send them to everyone. Would that be a good idea? And then, you know, it's as if I have extra time here, but everyone can read the questions and my answers as well. So maybe, uh, if that's okay with you, I'll send 
the answers of all the questions back to you and if you can distribute them then. Yeah, okay, like, yeah, back, uh, Becky and I, we'll, we'll discuss uh, the possibility of doing that. The, Thank the, you, that's really appreciate it. Good. And once again, if you've got any questions, even later, sometime later, get hold of me. I always try and respond. I don't get through to all the answers, but I do my best. Thank yeah. you very much. I very much enjoyed these three sessions. Uh, I found your questions fascinating. Um, my frustration is I haven't seen your faces, but that's part of the Zoom reality at the moment. But all the best. And thank you very much. And look after yourselves. Thank you. And and also, uh, thank you all for joining us. Um, just to let you know, our next summer, summer seminar series begins in two weeks on Monday, July 13th at 1.30 with Rabbi Dr. Yosef Leibowitz, who will lead us on a journey of the soul as we explore narratives in the first few chapters of Genesis. And as always, remember to keep an eye on the Haberman Institute website and emails. New classes and programs are posted each week. We look forward to seeing you all soon. Thank you again, Professor Lips, for this wonderful Thanks lecture. Thanks very much. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.